Welcome to another episode of Women Investing in Women. Robin and I love and look forward to engaging with amazing women around the world because it is women who help make the world go around, right? They say, if you want somebody to think about something, ask a man. If you want somebody to do something, ask a woman, right? So we are focused on making sure we're creating an environment and a climate where women not only inspire each other, women come together and lift each other up because only together we're going to change the world. And we as mothers and daughters and teachers and coaches and just women who are engaged in society, it's going to take all of us to make this a world that we all deserve. So Robin, take it away. I cannot wait for us to introduce our guest. That is so great. I always love your intros, Cass. They're really terrific. I am so excited today to have Karen Rockhind in our in our program. I met Karen some years ago. She actually went through the same program, the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program at University of Pennsylvania some years before I did. And I actually met Karen and didn't know she had gone through the program until I saw something about MAP, I'm going, oh my gosh, are you a MAP sister? <laughs> so it was just so delightful. And so um, Karen has done so many things to help empower women, help them find their purpose, find their voice. So Karen, I'm going to take, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell us basically, you know, how did you, you know, what are you doing now? What have you done in the past? Tell us a little bit about of, of who you are and a little bit of your journey. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you both. And thank you for igniting the voices of women. Because as you said, Cass, it's women coming together. So I'm on a mission to reignite and reclaim woman as the most powerful force on the planet, because we are. <laughs> and after so many institutions have have let us down, it's our time to come together. And, you know, I had a corporate career. I, I did everything that I was supposed to do, according to Ladies Home Journal or Cosmopolitan Magazine. You know, I got married at 22 to tall, dark, handsome lawyer. Uh, we had the big house, the golden retriever, the whole thing. And I found myself feeling totally empty, right? Like some like lost. And that what's wrong with me? I have everything I ever wanted, right? And so I got divorced at 26 and began my journey to say, well, if what my parents told me and society told me would make me happy didn't, then what would actually make me happy? And early on, I started volunteering with high school girls and just found this love of seeing them, like really seeing who they were and encouraging their dreams. I started messaging online with other young divorced women, and they made me the leader of their group because I was the one who was so encouraging and motivating. And I had this like juice. I'm like, oh, this is what I'm born for, it was to really inspire women and girls to know who they are, to love who they are, and to go for it fully in life. I just couldn't figure out like what kind of career is that? It's a very long story of, of you know, because I didn't know then. How do you like become an Oprah? Where there were no podcasts. There were no, you know, um, no Facebook lives, no TikTok, any of that. And so I kind of gave up and ended up severely depressed. And it was July 2nd of 2008. I was living in Cleveland, Ohio, and a man followed me into my condominium building and he pulled a gun. And I screamed and I fell to the floor and I'm going, please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. And now I look up and the gun is pointed at my left temple. And I thought, I'm going to die. And I realized in that moment, I was going to die and never pursue this dream I had of empowering women. So I made myself a promise in that moment. If I lived, I would do it no matter what. And just at that moment, the man took my purse and he ran. So I didn't know how I would do this. But I made myself a promise in that moment to live without regrets, to live fully alive. Like how many people, and especially women, do you know, that are just going through the motions. It's like, we're so freaking busy. We wake up, we make the breakfast, we get the kids to school, we do the lunchbox. Then you got to check on your, your aging parents. And you got, you know, it's like, we're so overwhelmed and the work, but we're not alive. And so that was when I found positive psychology in the master's program at Penn. And I got in. And I left my six-figure vice president corporate job and moved across the country to start over again. And I was 36 years old. My dad said to me, that's the stupidest decision I've ever heard. It turned out to be the best decision of my life. And for the past 12 years, what I have done, most people think of it as life coaching and motivational speaking, I am really inspire and empower women 
to live fully and to go after their dreams. No regrets, being bold, being brave. And a lot of it was focused on purpose for the last however many years, 12 years. And then about a year ago, I realized I was strolling my my son. I'm like, I'm 48 years old. I'm a mom now. I don't want to go by, it was called Purpose Girl. I don't want to go by girl. And what came to me was this idea of woman in all caps. And that what is called, especially now that Roe v. Wade was overturned, especially now as we see so much political unrest and we see so much of people, so many rights threatened, it is the time for us to reclaim our power and to learn to speak our voice in a world that wants women to stay silent, in a world that tells us we're nasty or a bitch if we speak up. So my primary work is like juicing up a woman to find her voice, to stand in her power, to know what her dreams and desires are, maybe with children, maybe without children, maybe beyond the family, maybe not, but like really what would light her up and then to inspire her to go for it. And I do that through holding live events. Like I'm about to hold an event called Woman Rising Live for 100 women to come together and rise up together through retreats all over the world, through teaching different online courses, in-person courses, and going into companies like Amazon or Capital One and doing workshops and keynotes like for their Women's Day. That is so very powerful. And I am so excited that your story and your message is being shared here. What is coming up for me as I'm hearing you talk is regardless of culture all over the world, girls are told you have to be good. Yes. And you have to be proper. And every girl grows up wanting to please and be that good girl. But that good girl is somebody else's dream, right? Mm. I'm looking at the United States. I'm looking at what you're talking about. We're 51% women, and yet women don't have rights because a lot of women go and vote against their self-interest. How do you think, how do you believe we can work together? The movement you're building, the movement Robin and I building, how can we bring it all together to have women truly understand The good is about the goodness of your soul and how you live it for your maker. And it's not every other person's definition of good. Cass, will you marry me? (laughs) Yes. I mean, I'm just such a big yes. I'm over here like dancing and screaming and like you nailed it. So a lot of what I teach, in fact, at this event I'm talking about, it's coming up. We're going to have a whole section on from good girl to wise, wild woman. You nailed it with good girl, what I call good girl syndrome. And that growing up in order to please, my husband's a middle school, well, not anymore. He used to be a middle school teacher and he, uh, he used to be an elementary school teacher and a middle school teacher. And he saw the difference between fifth grade and sixth grade, where fifth grade, the girls and boys would equally answer questions. By sixth grade, the girls take extra time to answer and the boys just answer. They don't care if they get it right. They just like being heard. They just like speaking. And then the girls start to doubt themselves. Am I saying it right? And that's just the amount of time that, you know, puberty is hitting and and girls want to start being liked, plus wanting to be perfect, right? So what does the good girl syndrome do to us? Makes us sell, makes us doubt ourselves. But I, I want to experiment with sex. Oh, but I shouldn't because my parents say, or even if I do it safely or, oh, but, but I want to have that powerful job, but I don't see as many women CEOs. So maybe that's wrong, but I want to, you know, it's like, so it makes us doubt ourselves. It makes us people please, putting everyone else first and then making ourselves last, right? Accepting crumbs. Literally, I see so many parents like everybody else eat and then I'll just have that tiny little, you know, schmickle of chicken that's like overdone and, you know, (laughs) or like apologizing. I'm sorry, my food is burnt. How about like, you are welcome for making you a meal, you know? We apologize for ourselves 24 hours a day. We get caught up in comparison thinking every, you know, we're not good enough we're so afraid to move forward. And so I know what you're doing. Like you said, you're on this mission. I'm on this mission. And the other thing that that all of that, and it's really all stems from a patriarchal world culture, what I call the swamp, the systemic white, oppressive, male-dominated, misogynistic patriarchy. What that has done to us also has pitted us against each other and made us think that there's only one seat at the board table. Or if you look at the institution of marriage and how it came about, one person was going to get the guy 
And so it was the woman who was the most obedient, who had the body that maybe that man wanted. And so it was like all molded in this way. And so the answer, what I see as the like the the trauma of being a powerful woman today, the answer is healing and sisterhood is really to see that we are not against each other, but rather there is not just one seat at the table. We make our own table. It doesn't anymore have to be that you need that particular company for a job. Like in a capitalistic world, we do need money. And there are so many ways to make money now for yourself or to do it on the side or to get together with other women. And most of us have had woman wounds, what I call woman wounds, right? Like for me in fifth grade, the little girls, my little friends dumped me one day. I just showed up to school and they didn't want to be friends with me anymore. And it's like my heart broke and I still sometimes think girls don't like me. (laughs) Other women don't like me because we have that. And when I've done classes, I've asked who has a woman wound and every single woman raises her hand. And so it's realizing that it's finding women that we can be safe with, who don't judge us, who want to see us be big, who want to hear our voice, who will say, say it, sister, who will say, that is an amazing idea. How can I help? And it's why we build the kind of communities that you do, that I do in my communities. I teach my women that when they want to like, they want to speak up on Zoom, they say, I have something to say. And then we all respond back, say it, sister. Because there's so many places where we can't speak, where people don't want to hear us speak. And so I think us having this conversation, us creating these collaborations, us saying, go listen to, to their podcast, go listen to her podcast. It, it's it's showing we're going to heal this in sisterhood because when we come together, we're a force to be reckoned. The patriarchy doesn't want us gathering, right? That was the whole witch trial situation. <laughs> but when we gather, we're unstoppable. You know, I want to say one more thing about that. When we gather, it's like, I might see, oh, Robin and Cass have a podcast. Maybe I want to have a podcast. Or you might see another woman like, she doesn't have kids. You think, I maybe I don't want to have kids. So we really get ideas from each other. And I think that's why the patriarchy doesn't want us coming together. But when we can see another woman and instead of getting jealous or judgmental, we go, ooh, that shows me what I want. That shows me what I'm capable of now and we make our own table to do it now there's nothing we can't do you know i'm really loving the concept of abundance and the concept that we don't have to compete with each other i realize that everyone will have different notions about some of the things you uh, you brought up but i really really love the notion of abundance because within the notion of abundance we can each have what we want and, and the notion that we don't have to compete against each other, we can lift each other up. So what have been some of the ways that you have seen or felt um, other women lifting other women up? Because that's part of, that's the whole notion behind this podcast is women investing in women, meaning, and it's metaphorical. Someone asked me, is this about finance? He said, well, no, it's metaphorical. You know, women, um, you know, uplifting, inspiring, shining the yes. light on. So what have been some examples that you've seen? Um, you, you, you've given examples of your own life, which is yeah. mind-blowing. But what are other, other examples you've seen? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, one of our fellow MAP grads, Caroline Adams-Miller, she does a beautiful, um, she has a beautiful concept of 222, which is each day, find two women to to speak about or to uplift or to come you know to compliment or say something to each day um that's one of the things i do it with with one person i say compliment another woman every single day um one of the things that used to really frustrate me when i would ha- spend so much money on coaches who had these big audiences i'm like can you please promote me like can you ever tell them about me and they never did and so one of the things that i've just made a commitment to is that when a woman is in like different levels of my different programs that I have, she gets to have a live on my on my podcast on my podcast. She gets to be a guest. She gets to do a live on my Facebook group. And I think we need to do more of that, like what you're doing here and having, you know, lifting other voices up. Um, and even down to when 
a group of women. So those are, you know, some kind of outside examples. But when you're with women, can you look into a woman's eyes and tell her what you see? You know, I think underneath everything, we all want to be seen and we all want to be loved. And so I was holding one of my retreats and a woman couldn't look in the mirror. She just really hated her body. She always felt like there was something wrong with her. And so instead of looking in the mirror, I had her look at each woman and had each woman mirror for her what she, what they saw. And she was in tears, receiving and, and hearing. It was hard for her to hear and hard for her to receive. And then collectively, we all went over to a mirror and put our hands behind her like we were standing with her and gave her space to look at herself in the mirror for the first time. You know, so it's like even just being an ear or mirroring or hearing another idea. This morning I went to a networking event um, where it was, it was a panel of women. And my question to them was, how have you advocated for yourself? You know, in a world where we're paid less, how have you spoken up for yourself? And just asking that question so that every woman there could hear each of these panelists have an example of how she advocated for herself. It, the more we can learn from each other, you know, the better off we are. That is so beautifully said and totally in agreement with where you are focusing this, Karen. And as I hear you speak, two things come to my mind. One, this is a program where we feature women. So if there are women in your group who will benefit from being featured in this podcast, please refer wow. them because this is all about breaking barriers. It doesn't matter what we look like, what we do for a living. Every woman is making an impact. I always smile when I hear women say, I don't work. I'm just a housewife. If the woman is not doing all of that and the man has to pay for a surrogate to have his child, to yes. cook, to clean, to do the laundry, there are no fairies who come and do all of this. <laughs> right. Men can't afford be, men can't afford to have a life, right? And there's over $1 billion worth of work women do for no pay all over the world. I know. This is my pet peeve. We need to Say come it. to a point where women start seeing their true value. Yes. If we were a global corporation, we would be bigger than most countries, right? So yes. how do we truly see that value and how do we bring that forward? And to that extent, Robert and I would gladly wholeheartedly interview any woman that wants to be featured in this and then we promote them. This is that what is we so beautiful. Well, I'm going to be sharing this podcast with my community, with my newsletter list and in my Facebook and all of that. So everyone who you know, is listening and sees us, you know, let your, these women want to want to uplift your voice. They want to invest in you, you know, which reminds me of, of something else <laughs> this morning at the, um, at the networking event, I met a woman who owns an exterminator company. When she handed me her card, I said, I've never met a woman exterminator. And she said, I know that's why I made an exterminating company. Like, and I said, you're hired, you know, like I would rather give my business to a woman and i don't know do you know any woman exterminators it's just not something you usually see coming into your house you know to to help if you have a bug problem and i said you're hired right like i love this i i love this idea that we we literally can put our dollars anywhere and and what you said Cass, we 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 are the the largest global the largest economy if if we included all of the the mental load and all of, you know, the remembering of the birthday gifts and then, you know, and the doing of the laundry, although I have to say in my household, my husband does the laundry. Thank goodness. Um, and all of that, but there is an opportunity to look at when you are making an investment with your money. So women, um, women manage the majority of, of the money, even if, even if they're not the majority earners they're they are the majority spenders and there's a question where are you spending your money and with whom are you spending your money and so there's i think a really cool opportunity to say are there women owned businesses that i want to support in this is this a company that really stands behind my values and that is promoting other women do they have a women's network at this company you know that they're that they're really um 
uplifting their women. You know, I even think about this. When a man gets older, he's called a silver fox. And when a woman gets older, we're asked to buy anti-aging cream. And it just drives me nuts. There's this opportunity with our dollars if we just said, no, we're not buying it anymore. You want to sell me radiance cream? You want to tell me, you know, a gorgeousness cream? But even that, we could speak with our dollars and we would make a massive impact. That is, that is such an amazing, uh, amazing thought. I was just, uh, it, I don't know if you're the, the, map, the MAP Summit on positive aging last year mm-hmm. and talking about ageism. And when you say, oh, you don't look like you're, like, I'm 66. Okay, I'm 66. Oh, you don't look like you're 66. You know, that's, that's really a form of ageism. Anyway, it is. It's, yeah. it's a backhanded compliment. Yeah. And thing- I, tell, I tell everybody my age. I just turned 49 a few days ago, a week ago, almost a week ago. And, and part of that is I, I want to change the conversation, right? Before patriarchal systems, there were matriarchal, before patriarchal societies, there were matriarchal societies. The, the relics the anthropologists have found were images of, of the, the woman, the grandmother, the great grandmother in the community, because it used to not be known who was the father always of babies, but you always knew who the mother was. So the lineage and the last names were passed down from from woman to woman. And so we have we, with our voice and with our ideas and 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 listening to the wise women, the the some call it crones, some call it wise women, those of us who I'm almost at the end of menopause, I'm 11 months without a, a period. And so it's like we are the wise ones and we get to be the ones who invest in those women and say, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear your wisdom. Yeah. You know, um, what I, one thing I always love to ask the guests is, or about some of the challenges that they mm-hmm. face. So either internal challenges or external challenges in bringing about the workshops and bringing about the things you've done, what have been some of the challenges that you've, that you've faced and had to deal with? Yeah. Such a good question. Thank you for that, Robin. So the first thing that came to my mind is my own mind, my own beautiful mind that sometimes thinks I'm right back in fifth grade and none of the girls want to come to my party. And the amount of, you know, work to overcome that, um, you know, like today, my daily journaling and doing my loving kindness meditation and checking in with that little girl and loving her. And and so there's the, there's the inner peace. And I just want to voice it because I think sometimes a woman sees me or sees the two of you and is like, it's so easy for them. They just put their voice out there. They just, put, no, it's not easy, right? It's, it, there's all sorts of fear that, that comes up. Um, and I'm someone who runs high anxiety. So I've been really honest with my community that I have, um, general di- anxiety disorder. And according to my mom, I've had anxiety since I was three. And so owning my own business, and I'm the breadwinner in my family. So my husband works for my business. Um, a ch- that It's something I wanted and can be a challenge because with anxiety, I feel like, wait, okay, my client roster is full now, but will it be? Where's the next person coming from? And so, you know, I've had to really work on my own internal voices and knowing and that's why I love purpose so much and regrounding and why am I here and what is this about and who am I here to serve and so like just kind of grounding in that from an external perspective um the some of what what has been challenging having a business is challenging right like I took my passion of inspiring and empowering women and made it my livelihood and I don't have my MBA from Wharton or Harvard or anything, um, nor would I want one. <laughs> and and so I don't know anything about how, like, I don't know anything about business. I've, I've made it up over the last 12 years and it's pretty incredible, like what I've made up. But it's it's been challenging to figure out all the pieces and parts. How do you put a website out there? How do you find clients? How do you, right? Um, and then the like the, the keeping going every day, even if you don't automatically see a result. And so for anyone out, like whether you want to start an Etsy store or you want to write a book, I just want to 
add that piece, it's okay if you don't know how. Um, one of the things that we learn in positive psychology is about a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset. And I always think it can be narrowed down to this. Instead of saying, I can't, if you ever hear yourself say that, you want to ask, how can I? If you ever hear yourself saying, I don't know how, you want to ask, who does know? Who can I get to help me? Who can I ask how? Anytime you hear yourself say, it's not possible, you want to say, what is possible, right? Maybe it's not possible right away to to have an Oprah-sized audience, but what is possible is to start doing a Facebook Live. And even if one person hears what you have to say, then it makes a difference. Um, and so I think also learning some of the business systems, like for me, have been a thing. Um, and then the... the um, So the the internal and the external, and then have been managing life while I go and live my purpose. So here I am, someone, you know, I am a motivational speaker on the topics of women's happiness and well-being and, you know, have spoken at like Amazon's International Women's Day Conference and Capital One and Progressive Insurance. And in the middle of that, I had multiple miscarriages. And after my second miscarriage, when I was 43 years old, I didn't want to live anymore. I didn't try to hurt myself, but I found myself saying, I already have lived my purpose of empowering other women. I didn't used to think I wanted to be a mom. Now that I know I do want to be one, like, what's the point? And I was so depressed. So how do I teach happiness while I'm so depressed? Um. And, and that's where really I've opened up to just being super authentic and honest about my experience in life and have learned, especially as women, that the more I do, the more connection I have with other women. I put out a, a Facebook post at that time and said, you know, I, I had a miscarriage and most women suffer in silence, so I'm not going to. And I had 73 people message me because so many women have had miscarriages. And I had some some men message me that their partners had had one. And so it's I think that that's part of the challenge too, is life continues. Um, right now, I have a couple of people in my life who are very sick. Um, and it's hard, it's hard then to go and spread the joy, right? But part, we're not going to be happy 24 hours a day, right? This positive psychology thing, it doesn't mean being positive 24 hours a day. It doesn't mean you're, you know, it, it, empowerment doesn't mean you're going to be in your power 24 hours a day. It means that you have the tools so that even when it is the hardest of the hard, you have the tools to weather and ride that storm like a surfboard. Or even if you get washed up, you have the tools to come back and to come back even stronger and even more powerful. And that's why I love the work about post-traumatic growth, if you know that work. Um, I know you do, Robin. I don't know, Cass, if you do. But it's, um, you know, that most people know post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic growth is that you find the meaning in the really crappy things that happen and use it to make it a, a better life to find new appreciation for life or new sense of spirituality or new better relationships. And something's happening in my family right now that's made my siblings and I even closer. So it's like, there's always something, you know, to turn poo into fertilizer. And that's such an important concept, right? Um, I work in the space of finance and leadership. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I do when I do coaching is, ask people to maintain a gratitude journal. I actually have one published on Amazon. Mm, but the gratitude journal well is not about being grateful for the good things. Look mm. at the horrible things that happen. How has that transformed you? How has that taught you resilience? Yes. How has that empowered you to become better than? Because ultimately, charcoal and diamond is chemically the same thing. Only mm. different is under pressure, polished to perfection, you have a brilliant diamond. And so how do we truly embrace and not get broken by the pressure, but enhanced by the pressure? So I love what you're saying. Yes. So, you know, turning place to go. 
Yes, this is so it. You know, turning 49, I've been thinking a lot about midlife. And when my dad turned 40, we bought him this cake that was um, looked like a hill and it was uh, decorated like a hill. And then it had a frosting man over the hill, right? He was like a frosting man bent on top. And I was 10 and I, I remember it so clearly. And it was like my introduction to what happens at 40. You peak and then it goes down and it's like, no, 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 no. Every woman I know has been through so many challenges, so many trials, so many tribulations. It's currently experiencing, whether it's children, aging parents, it's partners, it's it's breast cancer, it's abuse, whatever it might be, uh, infertility. And we have climbed that mountain and we get to stand on the top of the mountain and be like, I am amazing. I am so courageous. I got back up the next day and I still fed my kids, right? One of my clients, she had had a miscarriage and she was unhappy in her career and was like, we were really kind of launching her into what she really wanted to do, which was to go back to be a school and be a nurse. And she's like, I have no courage. And I said, you tell me a time when you've had courage. And she said, well, I had a miscarriage between my two kids and I, I woke up the next day and I made them food. I said, that's right, sister. Right. Just to wake up when you are in that kind of pain and to take care of what you have to take care of. So this um, this opportunity to and, and I'm a big fan, by the way, this doesn't mean that you don't get your feelings. You still get to be sad. You still get to grieve. You still get to be angry. In fact, a big thing that I teach that we didn't learn in positive psychology school, I teach women what to do with their emotions. So we do a lot on um on anger and grief release. I call it a rage rave where I turn on angry songs and we get pillows and we go at it because, right, a woman is not supposed to be angry. It's not pretty. It's not becoming or that makes her a B-I-T-C-H. And so it's like you're allowed all your feelings, but the only way you've got, you can't stuff them down. You can't stuff them down or else they're going to come back up. You get to feel your feelings and you get to stand at the top of that mountain and say, I am here. And it's not despite what happened to me, but it's because of how I grew from it and because of how I am resilient through it, that I'm amazing. Beautifully said. And that is a perfect note for Robin and I to bring this wonderful conversation to an end. Karen, we could talk for hours. Yeah, I Maybe know. <laughs> we should think about doing a half a day event on how to inspire and invest mm. in women uh, mm. in a way that our time and effort goes into lifting each other up. But as we bring this to a close, building on the theme and the image Karen has painted for us, all we as women have to do is look out the window. Mother Nature is a woman. Yes. She's teaching us. She's teaching us how do you flow like water and you get in the way of water, water will come back at you as a tsunami, as a hurricane, right? But she's also gentle. Mm -hmm. she, she nurtures you. And when you cross the line, she chastises you, <laughs> puts you in your place. And we women have no better teacher than Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. So watch from her, learn from her, and be her because she is inside each of us. And as we bring this to the close, remember, ladies, you are each a goddess. And Mother Nature is in you. And flow, flow like water. Because over time, water completely turns a mountain into a hill, into a rock, into a pebble, into a sand. Hmm. We truly can make that change without making noise. And it's that quiet power that we embody as women. And let's make it count. <laughs>